The massive hooking monster blustered forward, swinging his blade and reaping the area in front of him, mowing down his own kin as well as his enemies that were white with fear. He had skin of emerald green and eyes of blood red, as though raided by some bestial wrath unheard of by average man. The monster rippled with muscle and size, roaring to reveal his gaping mouth and his blade-like tusks. Surprisingly, a young, prime-aged human warrior wearing gray armor and the blue tabard with the golden lion of the Alliance stood before the monster with his own blade, not wavering as his brothers did when the monster began to reap through their ranks. The monster swung his blade forth that reached the length of an arm, but the human knocked it back with his own sword. As the monster recoiled, the human lunged forward and stabbed the monster through the lower chest before removing his blade and leaping back immediately. The monster only smiled and laughed as his bleeding wound did not even faze him. The color of the blood that shot down was even covered by the massive tattoos that covered the monster's body. The monster stood back as the human swung again, slicing a massive gash against the monster's chest. The human stumbled back and gulped as the monster gave him a disappointing glare. "'That all you got?' the monster asked. The human took a deep breath as his eyes widened. The monster would be the death of him, if not for even one of his strikes could affect it. "'Gryan, brother, to me!' The human with gray armor looked to see the brown-bearded, brown-haired champion rush to his aid, won an armor of gold. He was a pen. He was a prime age as well, and held a sword much larger than the one issued to Gryan. This warrior the human knew was a famous warrior by the name of Bolvar Fordragon, one who had been known as a powerful soldier of the Alliance military throughout many battles. Bolvar leapt as the monster swung his blade, and the brown-haired knight slashed the monster's neck before falling over. Gryan, the human who had originally challenged the monster, took advantage of the distraction, and lopped off the head of the monster who fell to its knees. The monster was dead, and Gryan gasped at what had just occurred. "'Excellent work, Gryan,' Bolvar laughed. He placed a gauntleted hand on Gryan's shoulder as he walked over to see the monster's corpse. From his tattoos and stature, it seems this was one of the burning blade. An orc, Bolvar spoke. It seems rather strange that the Burning Blade and his gang would be all the way out here in Red Ridge, but I suspect they may have just been here to harass, harass a few merchants. Ryan pointed to another orc's corpse. What's even stranger, brother, is that his men are of the Black Rock clan. The orc point he pointed to had a darker skin than the orc of the Burning Blade. I believe he may have come from Burning Steps. Bovar nodded as he bit his lip and stood up. I shall discuss this with Lady Prestor and the advisors at Stormwind upon my return. He then smiled to Gryan. But for now, let's just let the guard handle all the dirty clean-up. Why don't you and I retire to Lake Shire for a drink, old Gryan? Gryan shook his head. I have a duty, sir. I can't just abandon my post for a little merriment. Bolvar wagged a finger at him. "'Well, old man, I am your superior officer, and I command you to come with me to Lakeshire to get a drink. We'll say that you are my royal bodyguard for the evening.' Ryan shrugged. "'Sounds good enough to me, sir.' Bolvar laughed once more as he wrapped an arm around old Ryan's shoulder and took him off to the local inn of Lakeshire. Upon entry into the inn, the two sat near a fine window where the two would always sit and ordered the same ale they always drank as they did the same things they always would do when together. Simply talk. Storm, Storm wind has been in an uproar ever since Varian banished. I needed a break from it. From it all, just something, anything to get me away. Ulvar took a sigh of relief and sat back in the booth. Lady Prestor and the House of Nobles have made a lot of people angry with the choices they made. And the House of Nobles is in a ruckus simply because Prestor is so stern and obsessive that nothing seems as though it can get done unless you simply concede to her way. He took a heavy gulp of the drink in front of him. I do have to give the woman credit, though, I suppose. She remains level-headed in a big time of stress. At least she doesn't just run into the mountains to get out of her troubles. 
Or the people who rebuild, the fair city have a right to be mad, Ryan spoke, gulping down a little bit of the drink in front of him. He almost vomited from the strong taste. They been wind again and made it better than before. I do not believe they are in the wrong whatsoever. Bolvar lowered his head. I knew that you might say something like that. He adjusted himself. I asked you to come with me on this Lakeshire investigation for more reason than just tracking down a few orcs, old friend. After the riots in the streets and all the cleaning up we had to do, Lady Prestor exiled the unpaid builders to Westfall. And there's rumors of a possible and there's rumors of a possible uprising emerging in the village of Moonbrook. Ryan's eyes widened and his jaw dropped. What? The young man Edwin leads them, Bolvar spoke. He was the one who led the builders in their uproar and took the life of Varian's dear Tiffin. There's even speculation that he may have been the reason King Varian's disappearance. There's even speculation that he may have been the reason for King Varian's disappearance. So that there would be the even more unrest in the kingdom. Lady Prestor has placed a bounty on the man's head, and now there are many thugs and hoodlums headed to Westfall. Some to hunt the man down, and some to even join him. Surely you jest, Bolvar, Grian scoffed. Edwin was an honorable man. He had a burning passion for the Alliance. It was just as bright as yours or mine. There was no way he could... Bolvar shrugged. I am sorry, old friend, but it is done, and there is not much I can do. Being the Westfall native that you are, I am afraid I must tell you this, so that you will consider my next decision. I want you to return to Westfall. You will not be demoted from my personal patrol, but you will no longer be serving in the Red Ridge investigations. It shall be up to you to track down Edwin and bring him to justice or kill him, whichever you believe is best for the kingdom and the people that live in it. It is not much longer before more orcs or demons just spring out, and Lady Prestor puts this issue to rest, so I am afraid you will need to take this burden on your shoulders. Westfall, Westfall doesn't have much of a... Westfall does not have much of a patrol on the... A handful of farmers and their farmhands who barely even know how to wield a pitchfork rather than a sword. I just fear what may happen if Edwin and his rabble-rousers become too powerful, and if they become too much of a threat. That is why I believe you to be the best choice to make, to make on being Westfall's last surviving chance against these criminals. You are someone that the people know, and you have military experience. You know the land like no one else in the Alliance. You are, you are an extremely talented man, Grian, and I ask you this not just as your commanding officer, but as your friend. Will you accept this mission? Grian hesitated as his face became solemn. His lips tightened and his forehead wrinkled. This is an extremely huge burden. This is an extremely huge burden. He looked down and chuckled. But it is also an extremely huge honor. He looked back at Bolvar this time with a smile. If Westfall needs me to return to them once again, then I shall do so, as it is my duty to the Alliance, and so that the great King Varian Wren may eventually be found and honorably, and honorably set back upon the throne. But as for you, old friend, I promise that Edwin and whatever criminals he gathers will not take me down without fighting to my dying breath. Bolvar boomed and clapped. That's a hard-headed old bear that I fought alongside in the Third War. Your passion is great, and you are greater. He stood up and he hugged Ryan. At least, and let me make a promise to you as a friend. If you and I ever get a chance, I want you to meet me up here once more in Lakeshire. We'll come to the same inn, we'll sit in the same booth, and we'll order the same drinks just like the times of old. Only if it's on your tab, Ryan replied. The two men laughed the night away. Chapter 2 That day had been a distant memory to Grian, who was now middle-aged and hardened with scars of battle, with a bald head except for a white ring of hair around the lower part of his cranium. He now wore a golden mantle and a new heavier set of armor and had been promoted to marshal, as well as head of the Sentinel Hill Guard a militia that had been created and started officially by him so that Edwin Van Cleef could be hunted down and stopped. Ryan had been even been able to travel to the distant continent of Norfriend, and he and many brave denizens of Westfall aided the Alliance heavily, 
in stopping the Lich King's campaign in the lush forests of the Grizzly Hills. Twice Westfall had been threatened in the past few years. The first time was when Edwin Van Cleef, leader of the Stone Masons, had been not paid by the Stormwind House of Nobles. After riding in the streets, he and his people were thus exiled, to which they retreated into Westfall and began to plan for their revenge. Edwin recruited pirates and thugs and various other criminals and set a foothold in Moonbrook known as the Dead Mine, where he and his followers at a Fias Brotherhood had worked for quite some time to create a massive warship that would invade and conquer Stormwind. Ryan built a militia from the people of West Falls' capital, Sentinel Hill, as well as the various farms in the area also threatened by the Brotherhood's presence, gaining leverage over the Brotherhood many times, as well as giving Westfall a new hope. Eventually, Grian would find a group of strong champions that had come from Elwyn Forest and had taken out many of the Defy station there, hoping to take down Edwin for the treasure they knew he held. The champions infiltrated the dead mine, killed the criminals, the goblin engineers, the pirates, and even Edwin himself, bringing the head of Van Cleef to Grian's stout mantle in a bag. The second time had also been by the Defias Brotherhood, but they had been bolstered this time. Van Cleef's daughter, Vanessa, had watched her father's death in front of her own eyes and planned her entire life for revenge. She murdered the ones who took her in, the Saldines, and sent Westfall into a new chaos as she began recruiting allies from lands and areas outside of Westfall so that she would be able to resurrect the Brotherhood once again. Even recruiting some of her father's former followers, she reopened the dead mine and began trying to reconstruct the warship her father had once tried so hard to create. Vanessa would even try to rally the homeless and the drifters that had flocked to Westfall, concerning the denizens even more as the poor, sh as the poor shared a similar vendetta with the stonemasons. They had wanted to be paid. After witnessing the burning of Sentinel Hill, Grian took the Sentinel Hill Guard, formerly the People's Militia, and gathered what forces he could, even being joined by the forces that had joined the Alliance over recent years. His forces invaded Moonbrook, and once more a group of champions infiltrated the Dead Mine and killed Vanessa Van Cleef and her followers, once more bringing an end to the Defias Brotherhood. Grian ordered the Dead Mine to be cleaned and swept of any criminal activity and that Sentinel Hill be rebuilt from the ground up. He wanted Sentinel Hill to be bigger and better than before so the drifters and homeless could find work and have more jobs. He wanted Moonbrook to be reopened as a new town, so that people could have a place to live. Westfall had been so much better now than what it had once been, and the people thought Grind Stoutmantle as a hero of their land, having been able to lead the land of Westfall through two of the most difficult times that it had ever had. Nowadays, trouble in Westfall had been quite boring. The Riverpaw Knolls, who had fought the Sentinel Hill Guard for so long, had all retreated into Ed Elwyn. However, their leader had escaped from Stormwind stockades and was rumored to be lying low along the coast in a possible scheme to rise again. The Murlocs mainly kept to the beaches, but their numbers had also been reduced and thinned, and they seemed to know how truly powerful the Sentinel Hill Guard was. The goblin engineers were gone, leaving their har harvest golem in the fields abandoned. Some gnomes would eventually come in and take the technology for themselves so they could study it, and possi possibly improve upon it to use against the horde in the war effort. The kobolds had even gotten out of the way, as most of the mines that they had built through Westfall were empty, and full of material for the Westfall humans to find and use. However, Grian had begun feeling strange. He remembered that promise that Bolvar had made some time ago, and it had begun to bother him for the first time in several years. He had heard of Bolvar's terrible fate in the Wrathgate incident, and mourned what he thought of it was his old friend's death. But this feeling felt as though the old friend's voice was beckoning to meet him in Lakeshire once more. He usually just dismissed it as remorse that had begun to pile up after he left Northrend, remorse that had only just come up after he had focused his full attention in putting down the Defias. Now that he did not have much to worry about, problems of his past seemed to be stronger. Then one night, when Grian had gone to sleep, the feeling only got worse as he saw a dream that he had never seen before. There was a large blue-silver platform with white snow beating down upon it like rain. 
The pale white-haired knight of undeath Arthas, the Lich King, lie on the ground dead, a shadow of the golden-haired bright prince who had once ruled over Lordaeron. An image of a strange man that looked strange to Gryon, like that of the fallen king Tyrannus Menethel II, looked at his son last one last time and shook his head. Tyrannus Tyrannus laid his dark son to rest and stood to face another man that had been clad in gold armor. The old man that Tyrannus turned to had a long white beard and a stern look on his tanned face. Ryan knew him as a hero of the Second War and a member of the Paladins of the Knights of the Silver Hand, who Ryan looked up to ever since he had served as a young man. He was Tyrion Forgering, Slayer of the Lich King and Master of the Argent Crusade. In one hand, Tyrion held the glowing, vibrant sword of Alexandros Morgraine, the Ashbringer. On the, ground, on the ground was the helm of the Lich King that seeped darkness like blood, and looked as though it were a face all of its own, crafted from the most mysterious materials and metals that may have seemed almost ancient. Tyrion looked closely at the helm and then to Tyrannus. Without the Master's command, the rest of the Scourge will become an even greater threat to this world. Control must be maintained. There must always be the Rich King, were the chilling words, words the image of Tyrannus stated. The image banished, and Tyrion began to lift the helm to his head. But then a voice stopped him. Upon the throne where the Lich King sat was a being burned and blackened beyond comprehension. He looked as though he had been brutally tortured and in immense pain, but his eyes still burned with a passion as fiery as the one Gryon had known from before. Tyrion gasped as he said the name, Bova, and Gryon groaned, simply thinking that the dream had only become strange, like he had eaten something wrong. Then the being who had been so badly tortured took the crown and placed it upon his own head. He said, as, If the world must live in... If the world must live free of the tyranny of fear, they must know, never know what has been done here today. His eyes glow with a resounding light that stared deeply into Gryon and caused Gryon to have a massive, painful feeling of loss. Tell everyone that the Lich King died here today, and tell them that Bovar Fordragon died with him. That moment Gryon burst out of bed, sweating and frightened. There is no possible way that there is a knock on his door. The king sent a missive, sir, the voice of his lieutenant called. You have, a vi you have a visitor from the royal majesty himself, and he wishes you to treat him with all the honors that Westfall can provide. We have your clothes and armor ready for when you are prepared to come out. Ryan sighed. Thank you, he called. Any words as to who this guest is? Unfortunately, no, sir. The missive only stated that he was a foreigner, and this he was extremely interested in the stories Westfall had to offer. He was highly recommended by the Huojin emissaries in Stormwind. Ryan groaned. Not one of them. 